Uh, I'm going to share my screen from the beginning. So bear with me. Um, are you all able to see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So thank you very much, Elizabeth, for introducing uh, me and for convening this panel. Good day or good evening to you all, wherever you are. Since the start of the pandemic, I've had the privilege of co-creating three digital theatre works and watching many others. While digital theatre is not a new field by any means, as Christina has talked about, it was still a steep learning curve for many of us. I think I can speak for most of the people that I've worked with that making digital theatre in the past year has changed our perspectives on theatre making and how stories and concepts can be communicated in our practice. So in this short presentation, I will be speaking about my experiences making digital or hybrid works and the opportunities that such works presented in dismantling traditional models of theatre making or spectatorship. The precarity of our futures, both within and outside of theatre, has been intensified by the pandemic. We are by no means future proof. But we must go beyond thinking of this period as some kind of interruption before things go back to normal. Uh, COVID-19 has only catalyzed processes that have been underway for a very long time. So what sort of potentialities emerge? What kind of vocabularies do we need to familiarize ourselves with? And what sort of stories are best told in this medium? So all three digital shows that I was a part of was on this platform that we are on right now, Zoom. And they were all performed with a live telepresent audience. They were all devised works, but they each turned out to be quite different. So the first Who Is There was created by the Transit Ensemble and commissioned by New Ohio Theatre's Ice Factory Festival 2020. It was a work about racial privilege and justice across Singapore, Malaysia, and the United States. We began devising without a script, without a plot, characters, or narrative. What emerged from this eight-week process is, uh, was an assemblage, uh, in parts character-based magical realism, physical ensemble work, documentary theater, and political manifesto. So it was a critique on the digital culture of both COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, as it was made in the precise moment when these two cultures came together. You know, rehearsals started a week after George Floyd's murder in May 2020 in America. And we worked across eight cities and five time zones. Because all of us were in lockdown, no matter where we were based, we worked around the clock to make the show from scratch including alerting time for experimentation as we were all very new to the processes of digital theater making. The second work that I created, um, co-created, Passage, was a digital experience staged March, 2021. We had begun experimentation as a collective known as Random Disturbances since the beginning of the pandemic, but we quickly realized when 2021 came along that audience expectations for digital works you know, in Singapore was totally different from the year before and we had to shift gears. So theaters were opening up, people were meeting others outside and Zoom fatigue was setting in. People just would not be as excited about digital theater as they were the previous year. So we sought inspiration from video games and walking simulators. So what eventuated was a 40 minute movement based exploration set in one house, this house actually, and required audience members to decide which parts of the house to explore and which objects to interact with. So there was a story, which was the history of the house. 
but there was no plot. Um, the arc was the avatar breaking away from past trauma associated with the violence of this house, which could also be read as an allegory of any form of domiciliation or abuse by, for example, the nation state. So the third and forthcoming is Unbecoming, a work commissioned by Theatre Works Now Festival for Women. Co-created and written by Sim Yen Ying and Nabila Said, this is a devised piece on the mother-daughter relationship that centered around four women. It was originally meant to be a hybrid work. Audiences would watch part one, which was an hour on site live, followed by part two, which is a 40 minute conclusion of the story online on Zoom. But due to unforeseen restrictions after Singapore experienced a sudden outbreak in May, 2021, we had to migrate the work entirely online. So unlike the previous two works that I just talked about, Unbecoming is much more character-based and there is a story with plot. So as you can see, these three shows turned out to be quite different. But what remains is the idea that they had to be digital in the sense that they only made sense as digital works. We had people ask us, you know, if we would restage who's there physically, but our answer is no. I believe there should be a reason why works are staged digitally beyond the fact that there are physical restrictions outside. So the old cliche that theater holds a mirror to society definitely applies to digital theater, especially since much of our identities, our social lives, uh, and even our societies are shaped by, by digital means. So for each of these works I just described, we were experimenting with ways of encapsulating digital culture. So to quote um, Miriam Felton Dansky, we wanted to utilize a kind of viral dramaturgy that draws new technologies into service and pushes to the fore assumptions about how and why we pass ideas, affects, and gestures to one another. Zoom is a playtext, a performance, and a digital form that collapses old dichotomies between the live and the mediatized. It is able to ask these larger questions by virtue of the intermedial affordances on the platform. But this platform is also able to turn these questions reflexively and specifically onto itself as a mode of performance in our mediascape today. So consider, for example, the idea that it has now become completely normal to apprehend our mediated other, as I am apprehending myself right now, as we interact with each other. So on Zoom, there is no time delay between the performances of seeing and being seen. So what was once an uncanny experience of subjective interpolation that is normally saved for new media performance artists is now very normal, very routine for everyone, as long as they have a webcam or take selfies. I believe digital theater has the capacity to defamiliarize this new norm and reveal the circumstances behind the reproduction of the self vis-a-vis -vis the other. So towards the end of Who's There, after a particularly thorny discussion amongst the ensemble members who played their own performance selves. The women in the group reappear as the characters in the beginning of the show, even as the residues of their performance personas in the previous scene remain inscribed in their bodies. Sim Yenning's character YT plays with uh, Snapchat filters on her Zoom camera, alternating between a baby filter, which you can see here, um, she's the uh, Chinese girl in the bottom, and a triggered filter to depict how she is hailed by American and Singaporean society, respectively. So that this just for instance, the gap between how we imagine ourselves to be and the actual ways in which we appear to others is 
made clear in this scene, even if there are no easy answers about how this gap can be resolved. But in this scene's magical realism, these women and the audience watching are transposed into a digital space in which culturally based identities are not fixed categories. It was in this process for, of rehearsing this show, which made us more aware of our fragmented subjectivities as performance makers and as people. So in the first runs of the scenes where performers were to play themselves, they were renamed as their actual names. But during the debrief, actor Gafé Akbar points out the challenge of seeing his name and his image reflected back to him during improvisation, watching himself say things that he would not normally say outside the show. So we then introduced the framework of renaming performers as performers one to six, which acted, added to the fictive nature of such meta scenes. So in our upcoming work, Unbecoming, there is a 10 minute scene, which is essentially a process of digital snooping on the part of the audience members. So each of the four characters would share their screen and essentially start surfing the net. And audience members can choose to toggle which screens to snoop on as this scene progresses. So certain digital identities and secrets get revealed in the process. Watching a character struggle to write an important email or talk to strangers on Omegle as a 10 year old or buy a vibrator online affords a particular kind of intimacy and almost a sense of danger that can't really be achieved on the physical stage. So which brings me to my next point regarding spectatorship and participation. We found new ways of participation in the three shows that I was a part of. In who, Who's There and in Passage, we used polls, but to very different effects. So the polls and Who's There launched after certain scenes were a kind of barometer for the live audience and performers to see what were the general thoughts audience members had in real time on a racial issue. So the audience had 15 seconds to decide if a certain statement was fact or opinion. So trying to implement this in a physical space would have been quite clumsy and time consuming, but on Zoom, it's immediate. We received feedback from audience in talkback sessions that they were often surprised at the results, even though they thought a certain issue was definitely um, one choice or the other. So eventually the structure of the polls themselves was deconstructed in the later part of the show, as you can see here, from two choices it became three. So in passage, however, polls were a fundamental gaming mechanism of sorts equivalent to you know, the A button on a gaming console. So ideas about choice and the freedom to choose were evoked as uh, what happened in the performance was determined based on a kind of tyranny of the majority. If more than 50% of the audience chose to explore this mahjong table, for instance, that was what happened. So again, in talkback sessions, there were very long discussions about the dramaturgy of this function and whether it was fair or not fair. So indeed, my own experiences, uh, both as a performance maker and a spectator of digital theater reveals a new kind of spectatorship for me. You know, not, we're not bothered by venue restrictions, babysitting needs, train timetables, or indeed geographical distance. So performance talkbacks would last almost as long as the show itself. Audience members from around the world would come on board as fellow Zoom panelists to share their own stories and experiences relevant to the show. So I remember for who's there, the first audience member to turn on the camera was a father and daughter lying in bed in their pajamas. They had watched the show together. So of course, Digital spectatorship is not the same intimacy as being next to one another in one place. 
but it is a form of intimacy nonetheless. Likewise, I've seen how digital theater making presents opportunities to dismantle conservative and hierarchical modes of creating performance. The new performance vocabulary afforded by Zoom made our roles in the collaborative process very fluid and open as we learned the particularities of this vocabulary together. And this vocabulary keeps changing because of both the nature of the work and the movement of technology. In the Singaporean context, we were also able to evade censorship by staging our work online. As long as ticketing was done internationally, we did not have to go through national censorship procedures. So digital theater, in conclusion, is not a substitute for live theater, obviously. That said, the distinction between the live and the mediatized in theater has long been problematized. More importantly, as both performers and audience put their bodies and stories on the line or online, can we really say they are not with us? Alive? Thank you.